Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today we're going to do an update on what's coming up in 2021. I hope everyone has had a good rest over the holidays. I've got some fun tube labs scheduled for 2021. And on Friday, we'll start the year off with a bang when we look at the E80CC. An amazing, maybe, substitute for the 12AU7. We'll look at the differences and what to be careful about, as well as a review of the Phillips and Tungsram version. Now the Tungsram tube is the most rebranded version of the E80CC and if you look at the plates, they're really very similar on the face. But if you roll them over onto their side, it's really easy to tell them apart. The tongues ram had a slot at the top and bottom, as well as two fairly large round ventilation holes. Let me get that up and close for you. There you go. And the Phillips version, it's just got a little rectangular slot at the top and bottom. Let's just put those away safe and sound. I've also got the very well reviewed, high quality, budget priced Wilsonton R8 tube integrated amp on order. Wow, now that was a mouthful. With luck, it will be in at the end of January and I've got a whole series of tube labs planned. We'll do an overview of the amp, how it works, and some of its handy features. Then we'll go in-depth on the tubes. At least one episode for the preamp, driver, inverter tubes, the 6SL7 and 6SN7. Here's a 6SL7. We'll look at that in just a minute. Oh, let's look at it now. This is a gorgeous tube. This is a Sylvania. This is a mil-spec tube. Jan CHS 6SL7 GT with the waste chrome. We'll look at a 6SN7 in a minute. This has got a bottom getter and it's got that unique 6SL7 plate which is round with one ventilation wing two rivets. In this case they're coated plates so they're sort of a dull black and that might be graphite on the plates I'm not sure. These are um, they don't have a date code on them but they're probably uh, wartime tubes from the 1940s. And then we'll do a whole separate episode or even more than one on the power tubes including all the tubes that this amp can take. The sweet sounding EL34 and the more powerful KT88 and 6550s. And I think right now in the picture they've got they've got the KT88s in there or 6550s. And if that wasn't enough, I'm working on a prototype phono preamp that can use both the 12AX7 and the Russian 6N2P. Let's just put that somewhere safe. And I'll go grab the prototype. Now we're just doing a quick overview because we're going to go in depth on this. One of the things I wanted in my newest phono preamp, besides to try out the Russian tubes, because the 12AX7, quiet vintage 12AX7s with balanced sections that sound good have become incredibly expensive. You can easily pay hundred dollars for a tube, two hundred dollars for a pair for the good ones. And even the better ones typically go for fifty dollars a piece. So I wanted to try some other preamp tubes. Right now I'm actually experimenting with the 6N23P, another Russian tube. And one of the th design criteria I had is I wanted to improve the sound stage, which I felt meant that I needed two separate power supplies. So let's take a flip this over and take a quick look. You might be observing that the K 
cathode follower slots are empty. And I'll, we'll talk about that in brief. Here you can see we've got two power supply boards, uh, two full bridge rectifiers in here. You can see the four diodes. And separate filtration, separate chokes. So the um, the left channel and the right channel both basically have their own B+. And right off the bat, I can tell you, even the first version, which I had a lot of problems with the original cathode design I came up with, the cathode follower sounded brilliant. The sound stage was amazing. Lots of great detail. Um, more than I've ever heard off a of vinyl record. But I had a lot of problems with high frequency distortion and I just couldn't get that cathode follower circuit to work. So I went to a more conventional circuit and it worked it worked perfectly and it took all the sparkle out. It it even killed the sound stage, it deadened the bass. So after a lot of fooling around, I did an experiment and I actually just jumped from the last output stage and straight to the RCA out and I bypassed, you can see that little jumper in there, I bypassed um, the cathode follower. It's got its own problems and um, we're, we're tweaking it right now. With the high output impedance of this circuit, what happens is you basically turn the, the RCA patch cord into part of the EQ circuit and let's just take a quick look at that. This little section over here, two capacitors and a resistor, is the whole EQ section. And, of course, when records are recorded, the bass is substantially reduced, and the treble, for purposes of uh, noise reduction, the treble is greatly increased. And record styluses can follow high frequencies quite easily, but have a hard time with those low slow waves, especially when they're mixed up with the rest of the music. There's some ways around it when you're cutting a record, but what the uh, record companies started way back when, RCA uh, and all of the labels had their own uh, EQ curves, and eventually uh, the one that RCA came up with ruled. It's called the RIAAQ uh, curve, and essentially what a phono stage has to do is not only amplify that very low signal off of your phono cartridge, but it also has to adjust the EQ so that it's back to flat the way uh, it came off of the master tape. And that's what that little section does. And in fact, let's see if you can see in there, one of the last tweaks on the output stage of the EQ section is this little, um, this is a Russian mil spec silver mica. It's 180 picofarads, that little brown guy right there. And we're going to tweak it. We're going to drop it. Mathematically, it came in at 107 point, look at the size of this thing, 107.5. The closest I've been able to come from my inventory is 102. Um, and that'll be close enough. And we're going to drop that in there, replace that, and hopefully, um, and hardwire everything, clean this up and hardwire. Hopefully, that will be uh, that'll be the version that I listen to in some in some critical listening tests over the long run. I've been doing a lot of listening over the Christmas holidays, uh, but I'll listen for half an hour to some of my test records and decide. Okay, time for another change. Anyways. Put that aside. That's coming up. If I can get this working, uh, we'll look at the whole circuit, and I'll put up um, the information on my website. Okay, what else? And of course, we'll be reviewing tubes most Fridays. And that reminds me, we've had a lot of really wonderful tubes come in over the holidays. Look at these beautiful tubes. Isn't that gorgeous? That is an original Sylvania 6SN7GT, a bad boy. And of course, they're easy to tell apart. Let's see, get a little bit more light up here for you. It's got the black T plates elevated. 
It's got a large amount of waist curl. And if you can see in there, and I don't think you can, but way at the bottom, there is a rectangular silver shaped getter called a foil getter. And those are the distinguishing features. These tubes all date from the 1940s and 50s. And these tested beautifully electrically. Up close to new old stock. They're clearly they're vintage and they were used. A lot of the you can see the Sylvania has been rubbed off. Maybe somebody over enthusiastically cleaned them when they discovered them. They might have been quite dirty. Luckily, tubes are sealed, so it doesn't matter how much dirt you get on the outside. It doesn't take much with, you know, a piece of scrap cotton and uh, some alcohol to safely clean it off, working around the label. Um, they all tested beautifully electrically, and the big problem with any tube, but in particular 70-plus-year-old tubes, is that they might test electrically beautifully. They might even look new but they need to be plugged into either test equipment so that you can look for noise, or in my case, I try to keep as many amps available as possible. And these just came in today. They're already tested. They're already in the inventory, actually, in the store. But I'm going to sit down with these tomorrow, and I'm going to make sure that they, they sound good, that they don't have any noise issues. And when I ship a tube out, if I have an amp that, that handles that tube, I sit down for a couple of minutes to make sure that the tube is good, that we don't have any problems. And that eliminates a lot of trouble later on. What else came in? Oh, some beautiful tall boy Sylvania 6L6GCs. These are much, much loved power tubes. And uh, these are new old stock, new in the box, which is pretty rare for power tubes of this vintage. And here, I got a, some sm tall ones and some small ones as well. And it's not that I get a lot of used vintage boxes in, but not that often do I get a sleeve in. Look at the size of that thing. Isn't that huge? Anyways, those are up in the store. What else have we got that came? Oh yeah, this is really neat. I'm always looking for better test equipment. And I got a whole pile of volt ohm meters, and they're big, they're clunky. Here's one right here. Look at the size of that thing compared to this. Somebody on one of my Facebook groups, one of the one of the tube ant uh, groups, recommended this, and um, I just had to have one. This is a chip-based or computer-based volt ohm meter, and if you hold down, if we had this connected to a signal, if you hold down this button, it brings up a, um, a display, electrical display, like a scope would. So we get to see the signal. Now, it's not going to be the equivalent of a scope, but maybe that'll be handy. But just using the volt and the ohm functions, I really like this unit. We're going to probably do an episode on this. It seems to be well made, and by the time I get around to it, we'll know... Um, just how durable it actually is. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you all on Fridays. And this is Jim from Valves and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.